Good afternoon, Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, listeners, wherever you may be. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this Sunday again for a, another hot topic. When we come at you on Sundays, that's, that means that uh, something occurred during the week um, and we figured we needed to come to you. Uh, as soon as possible. Uh, today, we're going to talk about um, three uh, Black activists who were considered to be um, extremely dangerous. And we're going to talk about um, uh, Brother Nat Turner, who uh, was uh, a slave but responsible for one of the most notorious uprisings or historical uprisings. And then we're going to talk about uh, Brother Marcus Mosiah Garvey, uh, Up Ye Mighty People and Conquer What You Will, uh, is what he was often credited as saying to motivate the movement. And then we'll move up in history uh, with a discussion on Brother Huey P. Newton, co-founder of uh, the Black Panther Party, Power to All the People. Today, as usual, we have our resident uh, facilitator, uh, Sister Kara House, and um, I'm going to turn it over to her. Take it away, sis. Thank you very much and welcome to everyone who's joining us today. We're going to launch right in and get started with a presentation on uh, Nat Turner, who he was and uh, what he did. And giving that presentation is going to be Mr. Mel Hall. Uh, Mr. Hall is many things, including a husband of 16 years to Nicole Algenay, a father to 24-year-old Bailey Algenay, and the current chapter president of the Phoenix chapter of the Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. He received a bachelor's degree in English with a minor in radio television broadcasting from Elizabeth City State University and is currently working on his MBA. Welcome, Mr. Hall. Thank you for that introduction, Ms. House. And uh, like Ms. Lewis, Sister Lewis said, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about Nat Turner and uh, attempt to shed some light on some things that might not be known. Historically, the narrative around Nat Turner has him being a slave who became a preacher and made history as the leader of one of the bloodiest slave revolts in America that occurred in Southampton County, Virginia on August 22nd, 1831. Uh, Nat was born on October 2nd, 1800, uh, to his mother, Nancy. There are really no records of his father on a plantation owned by Benjamin Turner in Southampton County, Virginia. Over the years of his life, he worked for various uh, slave owners on different plantations. And in fact, in uh, 1821, he was working for Benjamin Turner's brother, Samuel, and he ran away. That was his first quote unquote revolt. After 30 days of hiding out in the woods, he came back to Samuel's plantation after what he believed to be some visions from God and uh, some signs. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, after Samuel's death though, Turner was transferred over to Thomas Moore and then the property of his widow. And then when she married John Travis, then he became uh, the slave of John Travis and the Travis family and went to work with them. Now, Turner definitely, like I said, he believed in uh, signs and believed he heard divine voices. And in 1825, he had a vision of a bloody conflict between quote unquote, black and white spirits. Three years later, he had what he believed to be another message from God. And uh, that would be the message that would inspire him for the revolt. In fact, in February of 1831, Nat Turner took a solar eclipse that he saw as a signal that the time had came to rise up and uh, revolt. So that that point he went out and started soliciting other slaves uh, to join him. And right about on that day of, of 
of August 21st in 1831, uh, about 40 or 50 of his supporters, they, they gathered and they led this revolt uh, throughout the county. Their goal was to reach the county seat of Jerusalem, where they were going to secure more weapons and resources and then continued on. However, they were met by a group of, of slave owners and uh, local white residents there and a lo little battle ensued, chaos ensued, and Nat Turner went and hid for about 30 or so days. Um, while he did hit, the, the white mobs um, took their anger and uh, vilified and murdered, oh, approximately 100 to 200 of the uh, local slaves there and indigenous people. Um, in fact, during this uh, time, you know, uh, while he was hiding, uh, he was eventually captured and he was appointed a lawyer. The lawyer made him confess to this. He pled not guilty. However, the verdict was already out once he was caught and he was sentenced to death by hanging along with most of his uh, supporters that were still alive on November the 11th, 1831. So this um, incident, it was one done a, a very swift conviction and hanging because the local slave owners and leaders there wanted to put fear in the heart of the slaves there, as well as the uh, local tribes there. And they wanted to put it into to any talk of emancipation. During that revolt, um, about 55 uh, men, women, and children were quote unquote murdered by Nat Turner and his revolt. And after that, uh, Virginia and several other Southern states enacted some very, uh, even more harsher and stringent laws against slaves and uh, the indigenous people there. That's the historical narrative of Nat Turner and how he's viewed in different segments of society. Some uh, segments view him as taking the wrong approach because of the violent nature. Some uh, people take it upon the approach that, you know, it was uh, wrong for those slaves or blacks or people of color to murder those 55 people. There are a couple of key things that most people don't know about this narrative, and it's always, almost always left out. Um, one, Nat Turner wasn't from Africa. He didn't convert to Christianity and become a preacher. Nat Turner was actually a member of the Nottoway tribe of indigenous people of Southampton County, Virginia. The Nottoway tribe had existed for a hundred of years long before the European had even come over. And they were ruled by Chief Powhatan of the Powhatan tribe who's most famously known as being the father of Pocahontas. Uh, along with the, the, uh, not, the Nottoway tribe, the Chief Powhatan also ruled over the Nazman, the Meharan, the Tuscarorn, and some other Algonquin-speaking tribes there. Also, what most people don't realize about this rebellion is that it didn't involve just enslaved uh, people or black people, and that was including uh, Nat Turner himself. Many of Nat's followers were actually free people of color that included uh, members of the tribes I mentioned earlier, as, as well as whites uh, in the town. They were actually involved in the massacre. The families that were murdered weren't murdered just because they were slave owners. They were also murdered because they were, for the most part, some vile, cruel, and terrible people that had bad and terrible business practices with both slaves and local uh, other whites there. So that is why you had both uh, people of color, uh, free people of color, slaves, Africans, and whites participating in this. Also, uh, according to local uh, Nottoway um, oral tradition and, and, and uh, history passed on by leaders, Nat and the others, after they were hanged, their skins were taken and tanned and turned into leather shoes and purses. And uh, Nat's belongings and his skull and bones were hidden for about a little over 200 years 
and used uh, by other organizations for different purposes. And it wasn't until about five or eight years ago that um, his skull was returned to our tribe, uh, enrolled members of the Nottaway tribe there in southeastern Virginia. And like I said, I am a member of that tribe and I'm also a direct descendant of Nat Turner's. So um, when, you're, when you're talking about that and you're keeping in mind, also keep in mind that this quote unquote revolt wasn't the first one of its kind. There were many quote unquote revolts or uprisings that occurred between the local tribes and the white settlers going back uh, in Southampton, Virginia, Northeastern North Carolina area, all the way to the 1711 war, Tuscarorum war between the Tuscarorum Indian tribes and settlers there over disputes that went back over a hundred years of broken treaties over stealing of land and other other disputes. So that will tell you that the Tuscarorum, the Algonquin people, which Nat, Nat Turner was around, had been dealing with the European settlers there as early as the 1611 uh, in Northeastern North Carolina. So that is um, some things about Nat Turner that I learned about when I was doing my ge family genealogy and I came across his name and I was like, wait a minute, you know, the Nat Turner I know was a preacher from Africa who led the slaves on a revolt and through history and reaching out to local uh, tribes, people, elders and leaders there in Southeastern Virginia and in my family was able to get uh, a different perspective, education and knowledge of Nat Turner, who he was and why he did. So yes, it was about freeing, uh, freeing people, but it was more about all the people there in the community and area being treated justly. Uh, the slaves from Africa, the local indigenous people, and even the white and French and uh, European settlers that weren't partaking in slavery or the cruel business practices of that time. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall, for that presentation. Uh, as a reminder to anyone who may be watching and joining us today, if you have questions on this presentation or any of those coming up, please be sure to share them in the comments for our open Q&A conversation uh, towards the end of this session. Up next, we are going to hear a presentation on Marcus Garvey. And giving that presentation is Professor Emeritus Gershom Williams, Sr. Uh, Professor Emeritus Williams is a historian, teacher, writer, editor, and community cultural heritage activist. He taught African American history and African American studies for the Maricopa Community College District, primarily at Mesa and South Mountain Colleges for over two decades. He served as guest editor for the Journal of Pan-African Studies, Special Edition, celebrating Haitian scholar and statesman Joseph uh, Antonor Furman. He is the co-founder and co-chair of the Banu Institute of Africology, Arizona, an educational and cultural collection which has hosted and facilitated Marcus Garvey community tributes and programs since uh, 2010. Welcome, Professor Williams. You're on mute still. Professor okay. Williams, you are, there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, let me just thank uh, all, everyone who was involved in the planning uh, and the organization of, uh, of these conversations, this discussion, um, and to the mayor, uh, the Honorable Coral Evans, and Living Black Experience, the Community, I'd like to just thank everyone and even our presenters today who I'm meeting for the first time. I'm meeting everybody for the first time, right? All right, let me begin. Since I only have 20 minutes, I'm going to, I have some notes and I'm going to jump around quite a bit, but I'm going to try to hit the highlights of uh, what I think um, the essential information we need to all need to know about Marcus Garvey. Let me preface uh, my remarks. Uh, I like to do what I call an ancestral roll call. And I just want to mention um, the majority of Garvey's intellectual antecedents because he did not emerge out of a vacuum. Uh, there was a long history 
of what we call Pan-African um, ideology and, and thought uh, long before Garvey immigrated to the United States in 1916. Let me begin with Mr. Paul Cuffey, Daniel Coker, John Rushworm, who was one of the founders of the first African-American newspaper, Freedom's Journal in 1827, Lot Carey, Edward Wilmont Blyden, Alexander Crummel, Martin R. Delaney, Robert Campbell, who founded the Liberian Exodus Association. And then we also have the Kansas African Immigration Association, Mr. Henry McNeil Turner, Henry Sylvester Williams, Benito Sylvain, Antonor Furman, Chief Alfred Sam, uh, Deuce Muhammad Ali, and last but not least, Mr. Booker T. Washington, were well, all of these, these antecedents and um, intellectuals that Garvey admired and looked up to. Let me also say that it was in 1987 that uh, I participated in the first, I believe, Arizona tribute to Marcus Garvey uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. It was 1987, about 33 years ago. And then as, uh, as Sister mentioned, the Benu Institute, which we founded in uh, April of 2010, we have hosted community tributes to Marcus Garvey for the last 10 years. The last one uh, just happened on August 15th. This year, 2020, we celebrated 100 years of Marcus Garvey's, the, we call it the RBG, the red, black, and green flag, uh, the Pan-African flag that Garvey created at the Convention of the Negro Peoples of the World uh, in August of 1920. I think August 13th was the day that he gave us the uh, red, black, and green flag. And that flag, of course, is still being used today. It's associated with the Kwanzaa celebration. Uh, it's been rediscovered by a whole new generation of young people, um, uh, conscious African-centered thinkers, so Garvey, there Garvey does live, of course, also through many of the reggae artists like Bob Marley and Steel Pulse and mainly, um, uh, oh boy, I can't think of the other one, <laughs> the main one that has produced three or four Garvey songs. Why, why, why is Garvey? Garvey is different. Uh, he's very special and unique in diaspora and history. And of all the three um, leaders and thinkers and freedom fighters that we're talking about today, Marcus Garvey, uh, he's an immigrant. He was born in Jamaica, I believe in St. An Anne's Bay, Jamaica. So he's kind of, you know, he wasn't born here in the United States, as was Nat Turner and uh, Huey Newton. So it's, that's one of the things that makes him interesting. And he started off, you started, tried to launched the UNIA in, uh, in Jamaica in 1914. But in 1915, he uh, actually, he read the, uh, well, Garvey, another thing that makes him unique. Um, this consciousness, this African consciousness, the memory of Africa uh, was kept alive th throughout the Caribbean where the majority of our enslaved ancestors were taken. They were deposited in the Hades, the Trinidads, Jamaica, Cuba, Barbados, uh, and large groups of them remained together. And uh, <laughs> it was to their advantage because you have most of your resistance, your so-called maroon societies uh, were born there and uh, they flourished in the Caribbean. Very few Africans were uh, brought to the United States, I think about 5%. Five to ten percent uh, landed here in what's called North America. So the African consciousness, what we call the Pan-African consciousness, that connection to Africa and the memory of Africa remained strong for generations uh, in the Caribbean. But Garvey was very well traveled. One of the things that um, was behind his this consciousness that he developed um, uh, around the African world community was he began to travel. 
uh, and he traveled to Panama, to Costa Rica, Central America, to Honduras, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela. And then it was in London, England. Uh, he was, I think he was on a ship and he began to ask himself, well, let me just say everywhere that he went, everywhere that he visited, he saw people of color, black people on the bottom of the social economic ladder. And, and this, this really bothered Garvey. Uh, it says like everywhere he goes, the black man is, is, is being oppressed. And so I think it was in London on the way back on a ship that he began to ask this question, where's the black man's nation? Where's his army? Where's his president, his military? So I don't, I don't see these things, uh, so I should help create them. And I think he was saying that this may have been his doom to become a black leader and, and lead this movement. And so um, he went back to Jamaica and founded the Universal, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And I know my, I'm moving around a little bit because I'm holding my phone in my hand. So forgive me. I know I'm <laughs> my head is probably all over the screen. Um, in 1914, he, he launched the Universal, Universal Negro Improvement Association, along with his first wife, uh, Amy Ashwood Garvey. And what's interesting about Garvey is uh, Amy Ashwood was uh, his first wife, and they, they held the first meetings at the home of her parents uh, in Jamaica. But him and Amy Ashwood, they were married uh, a few short, a very brief marriage. They were both young. And uh, but he ended up getting married again years later to Amy Jax Garvey. <laughs> so both of Garvey's wives were named were had to carry the first name Amy, and they were both uh, Pan African thinkers. Uh, very interesting there as well. Um, but it was after Garvey read uh, Booker T. Washington's Up from Slavery. Uh, he read that the book in Jamaica, and uh, he was inspired lifted he was he was motivated he actually traveled to the united states hoping to meet with booker t washington when, when garvey first traveled here in 1916 but booker t washington had died in 1915 so garvey was very disappointed that he wasn't allowed to meet uh booker t washington in person he was impressed by washington's institution building washington had pretty much single-handedly built tuskegee institute in Tuskegee, Alabama, um, and uh, Garvey was very impressed by, by that. How, how, could, how could one man create such a, a monumental uh, institution in America? So uh, he, he missed, missed out on meeting Booker T, but again, he was, uh, he was really impressed with uh, his, business, his business acumen and his institution building. Um, the, the, when, when you look at the Universal Negro Improvement Association, Garvey's thinking global. He's thinking global. He's not thinking local. Because again, he had traveled for a greater part of the Western Hemisphere and also in Europe. He hadn't been to Africa. He never made it to Africa, to continental Africa. Uh, but he was hoping, I think they blocked him from even going to Liberia when he did try to travel to the continent of Africa. Let me let me digress for a moment and say something in reference to this whole conversation is I, I, I made my first trip to Ghana last August for the year of return. And um, that was a, that was uh, in the spirit of Garvey and Garveyism, the whole idea of one Africa, an African world community. And I visited the, the uh, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, Center for Pan-African Culture. And to my surprise, inside the building, they, in one of the rooms, there were two huge, la very large red, black, and green flags. And I was very surprised to see that in the Du Bois Center because Du Bois and Garvey, at the time, they had ideological differences. Um, they weren't on the same page. Uh, just their approach to overcoming racial oppression, uh, their whole approach to uh, liberation for uh, of black people was uh, they would. I think there were some other things other than ideology. There might have been a little Emmy Garvey um, owned several newspapers. He employed a thousand people in Harlem. Um, he uh, he really didn't receive any money from any white philanthropist. He, um, he 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 was just much more successful 
and prosperous than the NAACP and most of the other black organizations. That met. And he was an outsider, so to speak. He had come from outside the United States. So I just wanted to mention that Garvey was an energizer of the, uh, the, for the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, he came up with the phrase, black is beautiful. He created a black doll factory for little black girls or black children. Uh, he was one of the first ones to say, uh, be black, be proud. Just be proud of your blackness. Celebrate your blackness. Celebrate who you are. Uh, this is long before the 1960s when James Brown and we said, say it loud, um, we're black and we're proud. So he was really in the forefront of one of those who advocated for race vindication and the philosophy to vindicate and uplift and advance uh, all African people, all African people. The idea, the term Pan-African, Pan means all. So you're talking about one Africa. And this, was, this, is a, this is a brand new idea that comes from the diaspora. The concept of Pan-Africanism was not born on the African continent. It came from Jamaica. It came out of Haiti. It came out of Trinidad. Uh, because these are the people that, again, stayed, remained connected and were able to preserve the memory. And a lot of the cultural, the Africanisms, there are textbooks that, that discuss the cultural survivals that people in the Caribbean were able to carry. And I think that's one of the reasons why Jamaica, or reggae music emerges out of Jamaica, because of that consciousness. So Garvey, again, is the inspiration for a lot. This the Harlem Renaissance, the energy he energized the Harlem Renaissance. And so I think that's very important to let uh, modern students know, students and non-students know, that he was a great energizer uh, and uh, that gave a lot of that cultural energy, the, a lot of the poetry, the novels, the art, the music that emerges from the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and I think the last thing I want to talk about is the whole idea of Garvey's institution building, uh, yeah, restaurants and newspapers and uh, organizations for black women. Um, and there's a whole list of uh, organizations that Garvey was successful at, at building and putting in place. Uh, there, there's just so many things we could say uh, about what Garvey was able to do again um, at the time that he arrived in the United States, there were many other groups that were competing for black membership and black support. And there's a wonderful book that I learned this from uh, called uh, Black Self-Determination, A Cultural History of the Faith of the Fathers by Dr. V.P. Franklin. And he talked about the timing for Garvey was right. It was just after World War I, uh, World War I had ended uh, in, uh, in 1914. And so uh, Garvey comes in 1916 and uh, you have black men returning from the war and they had fought overseas and they're saying, you know, we, we, we you know, we're not going to be, we don't, we're not going to take this oppression uh, anymore, this racial oppression. Um, and we, we, we've been trained as soldiers and we fought for democracy abroad and we're going to fight for democracy at home. So it was kind of just a new era. That's why this whole the new Negro movement is another is another name for the Harlem Renaissance. And so there was a new consciousness that emerges, and Garvey came right <laughs> at just at the right time. And I believe that's why so many of us joined and supporting supported his movement because he was talking the language and speaking the language that we were ready to hear. Uh, doing for ourselves, the three major components of Garvey's Pan-Africanism were race first, uh, race unity, you know, do for yourself first, uh, do what's in the best interest of you and your community, right? Uh, and I like that because unity and self-determination are the first two principles of the Kwanzaa, of the Nguzo Saba, uh, of the Kwanzaa celebration. So, so Garvey exemplified and uh, he actually modeled uh, he didn't just talk to talk, he walked to he walked to walk. And so uh, self-reliance is there, race first. Uh, what's the other? Nationalism, nationhood is also a component of the Pan-African ideology. So those three, self-reliance, uh, race first, self-reliance, and black nationalism 
are the three major components of Garveyism. And as we know, we still we still are practicing those today. You have people before Garvey who believed in nationhood and race versus those who came after Garvey. Uh, and probably most namely uh, 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 Minister Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam. So um, let me see. I have a couple of things, I think. I think maybe that's about all that I wanted to say, and then maybe we can get to some other things in the Q and A. I do want to say that uh, Garvey, the closest, the closest he came to ever writing his own book. I don't know if you can see this on the screen. Can you see that? Uh, I don't know. It's called um, "Message to the People: The Course of African Philosophy," and so this is edited by Dr. Tony Martin, who was a Garvey historian who we, uh, I think he passed away about 10 years ago. He was also from the Caribbean. And so this is the closest thing Marcus Garvey came to ever write in a book. There were 22 lessons uh, in this book of African philosophy. And Garvey, in three months time, he took his organization on a retreat. And um, on a weekly basis, or I mean on a daily basis, he, he instructed them in all that he knew his own personal uh, wisdom and knowledge, things that he had learned uh, in years of leading the UNIA and in his travels. And so uh, he laid out this book of knowledge and we still have it at our disposal today. Uh, but there are many, many, Garvey has impacted and influenced thinkers around the world, in the UK, on the continent, uh, all throughout the Caribbean, uh, South America, Central America, North America, uh, you have uh, branches of the UNIA all over the world. In its, in its heyday, the UNIA claimed to have 6 million members, chapters all over the world. But the majority of chapters were here in the United States. The state of Louisiana had about 70 chapters of the UNIA, and there were even four here in the state of Arizona. Um, about 25 years ago, I met an older brother who had told me that his family were Garveyites and that the Garvey people had come through Arizona on their way to California. This is back in the 1920s, so some Garveyites had come through Arizona. And that was, that was a, a very wonderful surprise to me. Uh, this gentleman and I, we, we instantaneously, we connected when he mentioned his family were Garveyites. And so, um, let me close my portion with something I had. I'm all, I've always got quotes, and um, let me let me let me uh, close with. Uh, I had two, but let me just close with one by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, and I'm taking this from the book that a good friend of mine wrote called "The Life Goals and Achievements of Marcus Garvey," and uh, this brother was our guest speaker back on August 15th, just not even uh, a little over a month ago. And he's a phenomenal uh, a historian. He calls himself a Pan-African writer. And he's also uh, uh, just a prolific. He's only 30 years old. And the brother has already written about 16 books. <laughs> I find that incredible. So let me close with this. Uh, whatever may be said about Garvey's mistakes, he cannot be recorded in history as a fanatic or a fool. His claim to be recorded in history lies in the fact that he attracted a larger following than any Negro who has been developed in the modern times. And that's from uh, the father of African American History Month, uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Up you mighty people, you can accomplish what you will. Africa for the Africans at home and abroad, one God, one aim, one destiny. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Williams. Uh, up next, we are going to hear from Reverend Dr. Bernadine Lewis on Huey P. Newton. Uh, Reverend Lewis was raised in the Geechee Gullah culture of Sapelo Island, Georgia, and is a graduate of Bennett College and a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Uh, and we are honored to have her speaking with us today and sharing her insights on, on Mr. Newton. Thank you, Sister Facilitator. Um, I'm really excited, um, and before I, I get started talking about uh, Dr. Dr. or Brother Dr. Huey 
P. Newton. Um, I, I wish that we will have time today to maybe get into um, a little more discussion um, with Professor Williams um, about the fact that uh, uh, Mr. Marcus Mosiah Garvey influenced uh, the Nation of Islam, uh, influenced uh, Brother um, Brother Malcolm Shabazz um, in his movement, um, influenced the lyrics of, of, of Rasta, Bob Marley. So he really had a great influence even upon the Black Panther Party, um, which is what we are going to talk a little bit about right now. Um, Dr. Huey Percy Newton, um, of course, was we we know him or and remember him as a political activist. Um, he's an he was a published author, um, but most of all, he was a revolutionary who uh, with a fellow classmate, uh, Mr. Bobby Seal. Uh, they would go on to co-found what we know as the Black Panther Party. Um, and this was in 1966 in Oakland, California. And originally the party was known as the Black Panther Party for self. Uh, and of course, it, it was a political um, organization. Together, he and, and, and uh, Mr. Seal, um, they created, I think, um, what most people are not aware of, um, was a 10-point uh, program. And it, it, there were a group of guidelines, and, and I want to share those today, um, for how they said in their words, that the African American community could achieve liberation. And um, I must also add that um, there was another founder of the Black Panther Party along with Mr. Newton and Mr. Seal, uh, Brother Albert Howard um, was also uh, one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party. Uh, at its peak in, in 1968, the Black Panther Party, as quiet as it is kept to many, had had about 2,000 members. And um, the organization, of course, later declined as a result of internal tensions. And um, there's a history of deadly shootouts um, and FBI uh, counterintelligence activities that uh, were put in place to, to weaken the organization. And so I think when people, most people, when they think of the, the Black Panther Party, um, we can always recall what most consider to be the bad. Um, but today our whole point is to, to focus on the good, and we will we'll talk a little bit about what what is considered to be the bad and the ugly uh, with Huey P. Newton and the Black Panther Party. Um, the party was very much alive um, from '66 until about '82. There is now a new Black Panther Party. Um, but it should be noted that this was not only a um, or an American organization um, or just in California. There were numerous uh, chapters in major cities and even abroad. There were international chapters um, in the UK in the early 70s and in the mother continent, um, North Africa and Algeria from uh, 1969 to 1972. So I know today you know, we wanted to have this conversation to uh, focus 
on um, what three individuals, three black men um, did for their people, um, all in the name of liberation, um, but somehow uh, society or, or what the so-called majority uh, wanted to villainize uh, these individuals. And I'm really looking forward um, to our panelists that will come on in just a moment to talk about um, how do you just focus on, on some, some bad incidents, but we never really focus on the good um, that these gentlemen uh, did. And so with Brother Newton, um, first of all, we talk about the good. If anyone is familiar with the, the free breakfast program, oh, that is, um, that's the brainchild of uh, Black Panther Party. They created and instituted the Free Breakfast for Children's program, and they did that. That was a part of their platform to address uh, food injustice. And um, another thing that they did, they had community health clinics um, to educate the community. And to um, they also um, employed um, health care providers to come and provide treatment um, of diseases. And, and back then, a uh, sickle cell was a major um, issue in the Black community. So uh, there were health clinics to address sickle cell anemia, tuberculosis. Um, and I can remember at the, at the beginning um, of, of HIV, and AIDS, the new Black Panther Party was very much a part of uh, educating the community, and they were involved um, in those um, in those health issues. Um, Want to talk a little bit? I think about the uh, ten point program, and remember, we're still focusing on the good. And the 10-point program was created, um, co-created uh, between Mr. Seal and, and, and Brother, um, Brother Newton. And this was supposed to be a set of guidelines um, that were created um, to state the ideals and, and ways of operation. Uh, so uh, I remember... Mr. Seal uh, describing it as a combination of the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence. Um, the the ten point program uh, was created in 1966, and um, the statements were were put in place. They were purposely made very simple, so that people of the party could live by it and actively practice it every day. This, this was what was supposed to be the guiding principle um, of the Black Panther Party. It was released um, on May 15th in 67. And um, at that time, the Black Panther Party had a weekly newspaper simply called the Black Panther. And um, so they, they, they did the, they posted it as an article in the paper and then they made a public announcement. And I'm going to ask um, our resident facilitator, it's out, um, it's, it's in a YouTube, if she would look for that link and, and share it with our viewers today. Um, so the, the 10 point program actually had two sections. The first section was titled, What We Want Now. And um, the Black Panther Party, uh, they described this as what they wanted from leaders of the American society. And then there was the, the, um, 
the second section, and they entitled that What We Believe. And that was an outline of the philosophical views of the party and the rights that African Americans should have. But um, at that time, if not still, now. And so when you read it, it, it is structured uh, similarly to the United States um, Bill of Rights um, of the U.S. Constitution. So just um, take time to go through the 10-point um, uh, platform. Um, just want to share that. So first section, remember, is what we want now. We want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our Black community. Number two. We want full employment for our people. Number three, we want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black and oppressed communities. Number four, we want decent housing fit for shelter of human beings. Five, we want education for our people that exposes uh, the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches our true history and our role in the present day society. Number six, we want all black men to be exempt from military service. Number seven, we want an immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. Number eight, we want freedom for all black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails. Nine, we want all black people when brought uh, to trial, to be tried in court by a jury of their peer group or people from their black, black communities as de defined by, and lastly, we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. So this was the platform of what um, of the Black Panther Party. This was expected that every member, even now in the new Black Panther Party, that that this would be the focus of the work um, that the Black Panther Party, any Black Panther member, does in the community that this would be the guiding principles, the foundation of the work um, that was uh, being done. So if we were to talk about the bad and the ugly, and um, I think what most people focus on or remember the Black Panther Party for or associate the Black Party with, um, is uh, in the, at the beginning of the, the Black Panther Party, and the party was founded exactly October 15th in 66. Um, its core practice was its open carry um, armed citizens patrols. And they, at that time, they called it cop watching. And um, they, they uh, formed, remember, the original name was the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. So they formed uh, the Black Panthers with, um, with this as this was the founding uh, idea um, to monitor the, the, the behavior of offices, of um, officers of the um, Oakland Police Department and to challenge uh, police brutality in the city. And so they were holding classes um, on how to, um, how to uh, protect 
yourself um, as a gun owner. Um, they would hold weekly classes on gun, you know, knowing gun laws, knowing your your right uh, to bear arms. Um, and, and so it's really with the continuation and, and many know uh, the day in, in 67 when two dozen uh, Black Panthers would march um, into the Capitol building and um, fully armed, but they were all licensed. They um, could not be arrested that day because they had not um, violated any of California's gun laws. Um, so, you know, if we were to talk about the bad and the ugly, um, it really stems from a group of black men, mainly, but sisters were there too who were carrying guns. Um, that that would make uh, or become the beginning of um, making Dr. Huey P. Newton a bad man. Um, a dangerous man uh, that he would eventually uh, become known as. Um, and so therefore, towards the end, we see why FBI counterintelligence had to send in, um, in their reasoning, had to send in individuals who would ultimately um, weaken the organization. So um, that's um the history of the Black Panther Party that really started out just caring for their community, wanting to do something good. We know that in order to live um, good lives, we have to have good health. To have good health, you have to have good food. Um, and then be, before that, um, you have to be able to live in a place of safety in order to prepare the food and partake of the food. Um, and so these are uh, what I would argue to be the good points. I, I think all of it is good. We all live here in these United States of America um, the Constitution says that we all should have the right to bear arms, um, that we all should have the right to pursue life at its fullest and to have freedom and liberation. And that is what the Blantha Party was all about. So, Sister House, will you come and take us in uh, to our next speaker? Thank you, uh, Reverend Lewis, for that presentation. And we will move right into our presentation from Dr. Stacy Jury on the vilification of Black activists. Dr. Jury is known as the Bowtie Professor, and he has been a professor for the last 30 plus years. Dr. Jury is a professor of political science at Dallas College Eastfield campus. He holds a PhD in political science from Clark Atlanta University, a Master of Arts in African American History from Ohio State University, a Master of Arts in Political Science from Eastern New Mexico State, and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Eastern New Mexico State. He is the author of American Government and Texas Politics. Welcome, Dr. Jury. Thank you, thank you. Well, the, you know, when we look at the vilification of uh, uh, Black activists, we can clearly see that is a major trend that is taking place all through America's political history. Um, those who fought for freedom for slaves, quite naturally, they were looked upon as villains, the uh, abolitionists. And then during Reconstruction, the Reconstruction period, we had 16 uh, African Americans in the U.S. House Representatives and two U.S. Senators. They were also vilified. In fact, a movie, The Birth of a Nation, came out, and that movie really did some terrible damage to the image of African Americans. And unfortunately, President Woodrow Wilson actually uh, applauded the movie. And then we saw this again in the New Deal when Franklin D. Roosevelt had a few uh, Blacks activists working with him. 
uh, with Mary McLeod Bethune and others, and people began to say that Blacks were troublemakers and they were trying to take over the government. And then we would see it again during the civil rights movement. So it was individuals who would stand up for what was right, whether it's Marcus Garvey or Nat Turner or Huey Newton, uh, or whether it's groups to stand up for what is right. When it comes to the African-American black activists, people will always make them look upon, look upon as villains or people who are a bunch of troublemakers. And even currently today in 2020 with Black Lives Matter, people looking upon them as being villains or people who are, uh, are troublemakers, uh, doing all kinds of wrong things and turning society down. Well, that's the way America's actually done it for a long period of time uh, because of the fact uh, instead of dealing with the issues that these groups are addressing, it is just easy to try to make them out as villains so that you can make them not appear to be legit. And that is a major problem uh, with America itself. What are these people uh, protesting about? Well, they're protesting against police brutality. They want to experience the American dream, like Du Bois said in his doctoral dissertation at Harvard, the Philadelphia Negro, that African Americans just want to experience the, the American dream, like every other group. But it seems like when African Americans want to get out and protest and do things that are right, uh, people look at as troublemakers and not just famous African Americans, but even you on your job. If you were to stand up and speak out for any, any injustice that you see, they would label you as a troublemaker and probably get rid of you. So it, so this is, has been a major reoccurring theme. It's a, it is an easy way out for those in power instead of addressing the issue uh, that African Americans are actually uh, facing. What, what, uh, what are they actually protesting about? Deal with that issue police brutality, won't empowerment uh, for our people. We want to be able to control our own destiny as the Black Panther Party emphasizing one of their 10 uh, 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 steps. Uh, uh, they prefer to take the easy way out and say, well, these people are just troublemakers. And we see it today with Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a peaceful group that protests. Uh, uh, and what happens is uh, we they get folks that come in and infiltrate them. And then they're the ones that do all the uh, the damage, uh, not Black Lives Matter, but people want to try to imply that it's Black Lives Matter, and it's not. They are peaceful protesters fighting for a just cause, and we've seen that all the time. I remember Malcolm X, when he was on the plane, he said he was sitting next to a white girl, and she she asked him, what's your name? And Malcolm said, my name is Malcolm, and then she said, it would not be X with it. He said, yes, and, and she said, you don't have any horns growing out your uh, uh, head or smoke coming out your nose, because why? He was vilified. He was looked upon by the mass media as being a troublemaker. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, uh, former John Kennedy's, uh, uh, the late Jacqueline Kennedy refer, uh, referred to my, uh, Martin Luther King as being a troublemaker and a race baiter. So anytime uh, black activists come together uh, to fight for a certain cause uh, in the United States of, of America, they are labeled as uh, troublemakers. They put that image out there to make them not be legit so people would not take them serious. And that has been just the major thing that has happened all out through uh, the coach itself. Uh, and so it is an easy way out still of dealing with the hardcore political, economic, and social conditions that these individuals and questions that they're actually raising uh, uh, for the most part. So we've seen it all the time, uh, uh, both uh, black males and females when they actually stand up for what is right. Because anytime one stands up for what is right, you and I already know this, we must be prepared to suffer persecution. So that's all I'm going to say on that little bit note. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jury. We are going to move right into our question and answer period. Um, so I will invite all of our panelists back. And we're going to open with a question that was posed in the comments um, that really encapsulates so much of what we're talking about today. And it's simply the question, why are Black activists portrayed as rebellious? And I pose that to all of the panelists today. Well, one reason is because, uh, see, people uh, feel that Blacks are supposed to walk around as being passive. And then the image of African-Americans itself, like Robert Staples says in his book, Black Masculinity, the image of the black man, this super sex thug, this athlete, and this crazy criminal. Uh, uh, and so uh, people, if we're not grinning and laughing and going on all the time, uh, we, we're, we're supposed to just go along to get along, look the other way. No, we can't do that with people being mistreated. We got to stand up for something, let's do what's right. And uh, so that's how I actually see it. 
I just like to chime in that also, you know, when people view uh, blacks and people of color as being rebellious, you have to keep in mind that's coming from those that have the power. No one that has power wants to succeed that. And when they are threatened by it, well, then they're going to do everything in their power to change the narrative and drive the focus away from the needs and actual attention. It's just like with the Black Lives Matter. You know, uh, those in power want to say all lives matter without realizing that all lives can't matter until Black lives matter. So controlling the narrative and the direction of the narrative is why we are deemed rebellious and why it's so important to to present these conversations so people can be informed and educated. Now, once they're educated and informed, it's up to them to do what they are going to do with that uh, information. Dr. Williams, did you, or Professor Williams, did you have thoughts on that question? Um, the only thing I would add is um, when you have colonizers or you have the colonial establishment, um, I think when the those that are colonized, when they collectively resist um, and they organize to stage or have organized resistance, I'll say, those in power, they, you know, they probably want to dictate or control how those people re react, how, how they how they respond to the oppression. And uh, you, 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 you cannot do that. People, when they're in a struggle for freedom or liberation, um, uh, for example, back during the uh, antebellum days, or the, the uh, enslavement days, there was day-to-day -day resistance. And the mythology was that Africans were passive and docile and uh, they didn't resist and they were just, they were happy slaves, you know, happy darkies singing and dancing and having a good time, right? And of course we know that's the farthest thing from the truth. Uh, but, you know, the, the powers that be cannot dictate or control how the oppressed respond to that oppression. And, um, you know, people talk about looting and destruction of property. Uh, and as one of the other presenters was saying, I mean, you can't, People, when you, it's a crisis. Uh, it, it's a survival thing. And when, 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 you're, when your life is threatened or your health and well-being is threatened or your loved ones, there's no, you may lose your mind. You may temporarily go insane for a moment. <laughs> I mean, so um, oppression breeds resistance and whatever form the resistance takes cannot be dictated by the colonizers. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I um, wanted to yield and, and give the kings first uh, here today the, the opportunity to answer. Um, I'd like to add um, to these comments that were given um, the fact that when those colonizers uh, came to the mother continent, uh, with the plan to capture uh, and bring over free labor, um, they saw and they know what they encountered when they came. Um, they saw uh, the communities that we had. They saw the education systems uh, that we had the respect for life, um, the the way of living, um, which was founded on um, being reverent to a higher power outside of ourselves. They they know all of this, and so the plan to to break us um, to make us forget where we come from. Um, and, and so just like these three gentlemen that we have talked about today, and there are many others and many names that of individuals that we don't know, that when you just get one spark, 
one inkling um, of an idea and actually manifest that idea to, to call for liberation and freedom, uh, then it's a problem because uh, they know from whence we came. And if we ever can reach or obtain or attain that level of knowledge and to be able to manifest that knowledge that we had there and that we really we still have, um, then the tables would drastically turn. Thank you. If, if I could just add one other quick comment. Um, Absolutely. Historically, uh, it, we can go back to Frederick Douglass and Martin Delaney and see where we have uh, two models of leadership uh, or think, think two different approaches to overcoming oppression. Um, you have what would, I would call the assimilationist, some people call it the integrationist approach. And then you call the national, you have the nationalist, the black nationalist and maybe separatist movement. But if you look at every generation and, and the last, during the sixties, of course, we had Malcolm X Shabazz and Dr. Martin Luther King were examples of that type of leadership. So we have a hundred years at least, maybe more of two, you know, two schools of, of um, leadership, black leadership. The dominant culture uh, seems to embrace, although they, you know, those, those, uh, there were, there were those elements of the dominant culture. They assassinated Dr. King, even though he was an advocate and a disciple of nonviolent passive resistance, but certainly they were not going to embrace Malcolm uh, and Malcolm <laughs> and his na uh, radical nationalistic approach. But he really, to me, uh, and I want to say to the, the sister, the Reverend, that uh, Malcolm's parents were Garveyites. Earl Little was a Garveyite, his mom and his uh, mother and father. And that's why we believe Earl Little was killed conspiratorially that he was he was killed because he was uh, he was a Garveyite and he was building that type of movement. Um, not, I hate to digress on that, but I, I think that was a question that you posed, you alluded to earlier. Um, but, you know, we've always, this black leadership has been diverse, but I think with Black Lives Matter and some of the, uh, some aspects of the hip hop movement even 50 years ago in the 60s, we, we've, we're still embracing uh, elements of nationalism. We think we need our own schools. We need to have our own businesses, our own institutions um, for ourselves. Because as we integrated into the dominant culture, we were absorbed into that. The miseducation worsened, <laughs> as we know. We don't learn our cultural heritage, uh, especially the pre-colonial narrative. Um, we have been miseducated in black schools sometimes and also in so-called white institutions. So uh, we, we need our own schools. We need to have, uh, and we, we're doing that now. We're, uh, what do you call it, charter schools? And we're homeschooling our children. I think that's where it all starts. Garvey saw that education, we have to be in control of the education. We cannot continue, and I did it to send our children to the dominant culture. We understand they have different values and uh, different, a different agenda. And black history is empowering. Du Bois saw this, Prodigy Woodson saw this, Sheikh Hunter Diop, Ivan Van Sertman, all the great thinkers and intellectuals have seen. Uh, it's so empowering. And I think the dominant culture fears uh, that, that uh, self-knowledge and knowing yourself is, is very empowering to an individual and to a group. And so uh, nevertheless, we still have to continue to uh, educate ourselves and educate uh, for posterity, for our children tomorrow. And perhaps in another 50 or 100 years, uh, we'll, 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 see <laughs> we'll see a different reality, uh, hopefully. Um, but I just want to say that we, I have to remind, we have to remind ourselves that uh, we, we've had different approaches to obtaining freedom and justice and self-determination uh, in America. Thank you, Professor Williams. Uh, I want to take us back 
through the history that we um, that we've discussed today to look at this question of the vilification of uh, black activists. And so I'll start with you, Mr. Hall, uh, in talking about the comparison of uh, Nat Turner as a freedom fighter and uprising leader to those uh, early uh, European American fighters for American independence and liberty. Um, there's a distinct difference in historical interpretations of those leaders and those such as Mr. Turner. And the question is why? Uh, why is his fight for liberty and justice for all, particularly those of African and indigenous ancestry in that region, uh, vilified in comparison to similar struggles from European Americans within American history? Well, in my humble opinion, you know, um, it all goes back to his story and, and, and perspective and narrative. You know, to the, the easiest way to, uh, in, in the movie, um, The Devil's Advocate, uh, Al Pacino said the uh, hardest job, he, the easiest job he had was convincing people that the devil was a lie. So we've gone through a, a period of, of hundreds of years where we've been told lies and, and mistruths and and altered details of facts of these people because then it keeps us divided, it keeps us blinded, and really it 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 keeps our eyes off the real prize. And you know the the real prize isn't really so much of where we came from. It's the fact that we have been denied and we're not viewed as equal and we're not given the liberties and, and, and privileges that other people that weren't even here <laughs> before us have and dictate to us. So in my humble opinion, when you're thinking about Nat Turner, especially I grew up in that area, you know, uh, if you tell the narrative that he was a rebel rouser, he was a murderer, and you don't tell that he was joined by all people in the community, and this was about justice and being treated equally and not just about slavery then you're able to restrict the narrative to one point and control it uh, professor williams there was a request for you to discuss uh the black star line and what was called the uh, the trickeration of the United States government, the sabotage effects of J. Edgar Hoover, the Bureau of Investigation. Um, can you share some of that history and give us some context for the modern use of politics and vilification of black leaders and black movements to discredit attempts to elevate the black community beyond historical oppression? Um, okay, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> Uh, Marcus Garvey had become uh, so influential and so powerful uh, in just uh, six or seven years um, that um, unfortunately he was vilified by some of the black leadership as well, uh, which um, it's, it's really shameful to talk about it, but um, I think it was A. Philip Randolph, uh, W. E. B. Du Bois, there was a series or three or four black leaders that they had a campaign uh, with the theme Garvey must go. Uh, and uh, as to the root causes of that, um, it's still probably under investigation. <laughs> but uh, the uh, what was then being formed, the FBI, they were looking for a way to discredit and to deport Garvey, to get him out of the way, get him off the scene. And so, um, I think it was around 1927 when uh, Garvey was, uh, Garvey had purchased several ships. Um, and um, I think he had named one the SS Frederick Douglass, uh, the SS Harriet Tubman. And uh, this is something I haven't read up on in a while. So my memory's a little foggy. But I remember that this, through the mail, uh, some of the UNIA members were um, sending monies in um, to, uh, Garvey was soliciting monies to, uh, to finance uh, these purchases and the ships. 
And I, the particular, I, it's, it's still really kind of unclear, but they, they charged him with mail fraud and they convicted him of mail fraud. And he spent um, five years in prison. They imprisoned him for that. And they were trumped up charges. Uh, there was nothing really um, that I think was uh, that was valid in the charges. But anything that uh, the United States government could come up with to, again, uh, deport Garvey and get him off the scene because he his organization, his membership, he was just too powerful. It reminds me of a scene that I saw in the film Malcolm X that was done by Spike Lee when uh, brothers from the Nation of Islam had gathered at the jail uh, and the community, it was a little bit of civil unrest and the, you know, the police were all worried, you know, they, all, all these men from the Nation of Islam and Malcolm appears and he gives them a, a command or two um, and he had full control of the brotherhood and one of the white men commented, that's too much power for one man. That's too much power for one black man because <laughs> those brothers, they were a military group. They were organized and they were sharp. And it was it was obvious who was in control of the brothers. So just that that analogy we go back to, again, Garvey came on the scene and in just six or seven years, he gained millions of followers, millions of members had money to buy ships, to build businesses and establish institutions. And that frightened, that was a threat to the powers that be. You're talking about black power. Um, we really had it. That's why still today, people emulate and want to follow the example of Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Um, again, any black man or woman who challenges and uh, expresses resistance to the, 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 the oppression of their people, you're gonna become a target. Whether you're an artist, an entertainer, <laughs> you can be a, an athlete. Uh, when the NBA stays their protests, and I wish the brothers would have held on and not even finished the, doggone the, the season. I wish they would have stuck to their guns and said no until this murder and this killing of our people stops or something drastically changes. We're not going to play no damn, excuse my language, no doggone basketball. We're not going to dribble no ball and shoot no balls for you guys. And I, I love the way our psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, has analyzed uh, different different sports, different uh, elements of sports, and how that, that's, that's got a racial component to it as well. But to summarize my remarks, I just want to say that uh, Garvey, they found a way to remove him, physically remove him, and he was imprisoned, and I think he was out of prison for about three years. He died in, in June of 1940, and so it wasn't long after that. He died a very young man. He lived from 1887 to 1940, so he was very young. What is that, 53 years old when he died? And so, um, the you know, it, it, it's really, it, it's, it's um, I don't even know if I can find a word in the English language to express what I'm trying to say. But America, it was okay for them to, to have a revolution to gain independence from Great Britain, from their mother country. It was okay for Patrick Henry to say, give me liberty or give me death. And for them to ride around and, and, and you know, take up arms and defend themselves by any means necessary. But when black people, African people, people of color resort to the same means, then there's a problem. If a black man picks up a gun, you know, a Maxim gun <laughs> or any type of weapon to defend himself, his life, then why is that such a problem when all humans practice self-preservation, the first law of nature? So uh, again, uh, we have to define, uh, you know, we have a struggle. It's an ongoing struggle. The struggle continues. And whether it's nonviolent or it's violent, we will achieve liberation uh, by any means necessary. I think... Uh Amen. I think that uh, um, Marcus Garvey uh, raised, uh, I think, millions of dollars in like two days. That's how powerful this guy was. Uh, Tony Martin has a book called Race First. Marcus Garvey was a very excellent guy. And as uh, 
Professor Williams pointed out, um, it was Calvin Coolidge, they pardoned him, and then they went on and ran him out the country, President Calvin Coolidge, they ran him out the country. Yeah, they told him to get out the country. Uh, they have a tendency to do that. Du Bois faced the same thing, he would end up dying in Ghana. So, but I will say, I want to say, uh, uh, vilification also, when, when people get vil vilified, it's also external and internal. External mean outside groups, and then internal meaning your own people actually attacking you as well. And it goes on both ways. So I remember in a lot of Dr. King's speeches, he pointed out how he was constantly being criticized by African-American preachers. On, from every side, he was getting, so it's on both sides. It's just not on one side is doing it. It's like you, 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 you're like in the middle. I think this is why he wrote his uh, famous big, uh, Birmingham letters uh, to let them know, hey, we, we got to move. But yeah, you get attacked on both sides. Uh, so, uh, absolutely. Uh, Reverend Lewis, we discussed the 10 point program of the Black Panther Party. And uh, what's curious to me is the fact that none of those are controversial asks. Uh, they're not violent asks, they're not problematic asks. And in a society uh, that truly values life, liberty, and freedom and justice for all. Uh, we see the same thing with the tenets of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, today. And so the question that I think we have to ask is, why was and why are such challenges to current systems that are and have been oppressive to Black people in America perceived as threats, as terroristic, and as problematic? I, I go back to my last comment. If we as a people in, in, in mass will recall who we were, and, and this is something that, I, that immediately drew me to uh, Mr. Garvey. If you can remember if you can free yourself from mental slavery and, and remember who, who you once were, the power in that, nothing, we came from nothing, but yet look at all of the resources that are found on the mother continent. Um, if we can recall who we were before we went through this horrible experience. Imagine uh, the, the power politically, financially, um, that we would have as a people here in America. So that's why um, the Garvey movement, um, you know, even Brother Turner's movement, uh, black people coming together. Why is it still on your job when you see when when the European American sees two or three black people huddled together talking? Oh, it's a problem. <laughs> what are they talking about? Um, and and so that that uh, plan to keep us divided um, because they know potentially what will occur. We've seen it, the Nation of Islam, we, we've seen it, uh, Dr. King's movement, um, we've seen it, the Black Panther Party. So we've seen the power of, of, of 25, 50, 2,000 people coming together, 100 people. We've seen the power, look at what uh, this coalition is doing um, amongst ourselves, 10, how we're reaching people. And mind, the, the rumblings have already started about um, how to better do this, how we should, um, this could be a better broadcast. Well, um, we're doing as we feel we are being led. Um, we no longer have to ask permission from the good master. Um, we're doing what we think we need to do uh, to inform, to educate, and enlighten um, our European American brothers and sisters, as well as to empower ourselves. And that, when those things begin to happen, that's when it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jury, 
uh, we also had a request to dive deeper into uh, what we might call the dichotomy of black leaders or the dichotomy of black thought when it comes to this subject. Um, the question was really to explain the black individual who embraces uh, the slave mentality and how it relates to modern society. And so, you know, we talked about how there were those who led slave rebellions and there were those who seemed to embrace the slave mentality and, and not push back. We have uh, leaders going into the early 20th century who uh, on one side were more um, were presented as the rebel and the the rebellious leader and those who were more passive um, you have the the active leader and then the more passive or, or pacifist or more palatable leaders so can you give us a little bit more uh, context and insight into that um, and how it relates to modern society. Um, when we look at uh, the slave mentality, uh, these are people who uh, do not necessarily want to see change. I remember Dr. Kwame Nkrumah in his book, Africa Must Unite pointed out that there's usually three types of people in society. Those who want to change society, uh, those who don't want to change society, and those who want to get in power and perpetuate the same uh, policies. And in modern society today, uh, what we have is individuals who really don't want to see society uh, change that much. Uh, they, they, because they're benefiting from society. I, for example, once I explained to my students, they even had a few free, free Negroes in the South that had slaves. But they, so they wanted to have their own status and things like that. So they did not want to change society. But change comes at a pace in which you must face conflict and opposition. And if you're going to change a system, you must be ready to be prepared to suffer persecution. A lot of people don't want to do that. They're in the comfort zone. So therefore, if I see, say, Brother Melvin Hall saying a few things, I'm going to go, be quiet, man. I don't I want no trouble. I like my job. So in modern society today, you make it $150,000 driving a BMW, got your kids in private school, and you married somebody making $150,000, uh, you. and I'll tell you all this, this be on this program. I'll tell you all this, uh, being on the career that I'll be in, because I've been kicked off my job <laughs> for standing up you and uh, speak it out so but anyhow uh uh I, you know i think I, I got it back but anyhow but, but to make a long story short uh in modern society today people once they get comfortable in terms of the kind of lifestyle that they live because some people love luxury comfort and security and they do not want that to be interrupted and, and what happens in the modern society that we live in if you try to disrupt that they don't they don't want they don't want that to be disrupted but they fail to realize they're able to enjoy what they have because other folks that came before them died for them to be able to enjoy the American dream that they actually have. Uh, I would to say. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot have a different view for me. I may think one way, you may think another way. I'm not saying you don't have to think like me because I, I do believe in diversity of thought. Uh, but there are some times when you need to stand up uh, uh, and, and, and be held accountable and not look the other way, especially when there's injustice and, and unrighteousness going on. Ms. House, I'd just like to add to Dr. Drury's statement. Also, you know, the slave mentality encompasses the, the phrase, there's a cost to be the boss. And in, in social change, economic change and, uh, uh, fight for equality, there's going to be a revolution. There's going to be a revolt. There's going to be an uprising, and it won't be pretty. It involves bloodshed. It involves the loss of life. It involves the loss of, of many of the freedoms that we enjoy today. So I was just in a conversation with someone yesterday about how we needed to reconstruct our political system and this person looked at me and said, hey, you know what? I enjoy my job too much. I love my, my BMW. I love my 4,500 square foot house and the salary I have. I'm cool with things the way they are. So that is another part of the fight. People have to decide, do they want to sacrifice for the overall good? Or are they just content in being a part of the system as is? Amen. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to just invite all of our speakers, if you have any, uh, 
Professor Williams, did you have, you're muted, sir. If we could just look at, Malcolm gave a very simple, simple analogy when he mentioned the, um, the house Negro in the field slave, or the house servant in the field servant. And so it's interesting that many of the house servants were actually um, children or offspring of the, um, of the white men, of the plantation owners. Uh, and this produced what we call a, a, like a group of a mulattoes, a, um, and I'm trying to remember the number of mulattoes that existed during the time of the Civil War, but there were, uh, I think there were something like 144,000 that was estimated. But anyway, the, 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 the um, house servants, those males and females that worked in the house for the most part, of course, we know they had access to uh, better food, better clothing, um, and sometimes even information versus the field hand, the field servants, who were the majority, and they didn't, they were not in close proximity to the master class, so-called masters. But even there's an exception. We have to make exceptions for some of many of those um, house servants. I hate to call them slaves, but they're those enslaved people in the house. They might have been biracial or mulatto, but they sometimes were the ones who were most resistant and rebellious and wanted to organize uh, the resistance movements. Might have been leaders or organizers of the resistance movement. They up in Master's house during the day and at night, uh, they're meeting out in the fields in the woods, planning the insurrections uh, with the field hands. So, uh, but that was the way they divided us. And of course, the whole Willie Lynch thing has been uh, we know it's been it's been a dispelled a myth has been dispelled, but those same tactics were used to divide our people um, in terms of skin color and and hair texture and you know it was it was class um, uh, anything that they could use uh, I would say scientifically <laughs> to try to divide and rule and control uh, our folks what was put in place and but like my man said you had we've had internal uh, disunification. Unfortunately, we've had uh, within the ranks. Uh, we we haven't closed ranks with. And uh, something that Malcolm was saying one day, it might have seemed harsh at the time, but I think it was a student at Boston University. And somewhere asked him, "What could she join, and and, and what could she do uh, with the Nation of Islam to help support the Black Freedom Struggle?" And <laughs> I believe if brothers can help me out with this one, but I think he said, "Well." I think she could she could go back to her own community and work among her, her folks, but there was nothing that she could do inside the nation uh, of Islam and, and that struggle. Um, but I may be a little off back, a little off base with my facts. So I just want to say that the house Negro and the field Negro is uh, if we can still apply that same kind of mentality, that mentality uh, in, in contemporary times. Um, and my brother said people, a lot of us are complacent. And a lot of times uh, people have used this pacification approach. Um, you know, we get the nice home and the nice cars and, and then we become complacent. And, uh, you know, we, we don't want no, because we struggle so hard to, to get anything. Most of us haven't had anything materialistically, no money, uh, no, nothing in, in terms of wealth. And so when we, when we acquire those things, we, we will give our lives to keep those and, and preserve those things. Um, and uh, it's, it's just, that's just the way it is. But sometimes a man said, you have to make, uh, what is it called? Uh, you have to commit class suicide and sacrifice all of that for the greater good. I'll just leave it at that. Amen. Well, I'd like to now invite, as we approach our time, uh, each of our speakers to give any closing thoughts that they may have as we wrap up this conversation. And we'll start with Mr. Hall. Well, I'd just like to say that, you know, as always, there has to, this is probably the most important step in, in the journey that we're undertaking and it's having a proper education and a proper communication of, of you know, what we're facing. Because, you know, there's a saying, um, those that don't learn from their history are doomed to repeat it. And 
part of what we're suffering from as a as a people of color here in our fight you look back you know we've for the last hundred plus years we've been asking for equality we've been asking for fair treatment for the police and we've been asking to be viewed as human beings and you know here it is we're still fighting that fight so i i think we have to come to an education of knowing who we are where we've been all the things we've accomplished and then taking that and, and bounding it to ourselves and become resilient and unified and saying we're not going to accept anything less than being treated equally as everyone else in this country has been. Professor Williams. Uh, okay, wow. Well, let me again thank you all for um, for hosting and facilitating this um, Oh, I forget. I don't need to hold the phone to my ear to talk. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, I, um, I'm proud and honored and humbled to be a participant. And I hope that we continue these dialogues. Um, I'm, I'm really hoping for the day when we can all do this in the same room, we can be in the same space together. <laughs> This COVID-19 thing has really been pissing me off. <laughs> A lot of, I'm sure it's pissing you guys off as well. So uh, I, um, I'm i proud um, to be able to just share a few, um, share a bit of a piece of information about the most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey and to listen to the other presenters uh, share about our brother, uh, Nat Turner. I, I wanna just say that I think Nat Turner's insurrection may have been as inspired uh, after someone read David Walker's Appeal, uh, which was published in 1829. Now, another free black man who mysteriously came up dead uh, shortly after uh, the publication in 1829. And um, we didn't mention Denmark VC and Gabriel Prosser and some of the other rebellions, the Stono rebellions that had taken place. I don't think we brought those up, but we have been constantly um, attempting to vindicate our humanity uh, and to, um, uh, I guess, get the world to see our the equality of our people, the beauty of our people. And when you look at the major contributions that we've made, both pre and post enslavement, uh, I mean, I, you know, where would the Olympics be without black folks? You know, I mean, there's so many, I mean, music and art and uh, literature, um, I mean, you name it, and we're there. And so um, I, I just want to say that Garvey is probably one of the supreme examples um, of, uh, of we'll say, we'll say Pan-African leadership and we need to continue to follow that, to follow that today. Even linking up, I was in a conversation yesterday with the former ambassador for the United Nations, Dr. Ari Khanna. She was our keynote speaker. And she's talking about the continent of Africa, the struggles that our people have there. And then we've got our own struggles here in America. We can't even look outside the United States a lot of times because we're struggling right here at home. But we're gonna link all these struggles up. We're gonna unify and empower our people globally and. That's the big vision and the bigger picture. So thank you again for having me. And I'm looking forward to meeting you all face to face one day. Uh, the bro One brother doesn't live in Arizona, but we're going to get him here. Or we'll get there. We'll all get together and embrace one another and feel that energy that we all have, that passion for our people, our love, love for our people like Garvey had. And thank you so much. And I want to just, again, give thanks and praises to the creator and the ancestors. Ashe. Ashe. Amen. Uh, Professor Jur or Dr. Jury. Um, I'd like to say I'd like to just thank everyone for this uh, little conference that we've actually had. Um, and I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity. But I do want to emphasize uh, one thing, and that is, even though I love all people, the African-American must understand that he or she is unique than any other group for the one number one reason. We came over here against our will. Mm -hmm. America owes us a great deal. You cannot even go through a day without using something to come in contact with something that a black man or a black woman invented. Yeah. So yes, we can say, you know, black folks and other peoples of colors, but remember, you can't compare our struggle with anybody else. We were forced over here against our will. That's what makes us unique, more, more unique than anybody else. 
Absolutely. You cannot compare my struggle with somebody coming on the tube at a time. I was forced on ships. So let that be understood. Uh, mm. Yes, sir. So because that was makes us unique more than any other group, any other group. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, with it itself, so uh, other folks can jump on the bandwagon, that's fine, but let that be understood. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, anyhow, uh, but so I want to thank you all for having me, and I really did enjoy this. Thank you, sure. Reverend Lewis. Um, I'll I'll res I'll close out my or bring my statements after you bring us officially to the end. Perfect. Thank you. Well, I just want to uh, thank everyone again for participating in this conversation, for all of the presenters, for the knowledge that you shared with us, for the history that you shared with us, and for the empowerment that you shared with us. Um, I want to echo words going back to something that uh, uh, Reverend Lewis shared, which was to uh, remind us of the power of who we are um, and to keep remembering who we are, who we have been and who we can become. Uh, we thank those who attended today and, and shared in this conversation with us. And we invite you to come back and join us again on uh, Wednesday, uh, the 7th of October. We are settling the time because we recognize that it was coming at the same time as the vice presidential debate. Uh, but the topic for that conversation is unequal opportunity, race, and education. And we will certainly notify everyone of what the time will be uh, and where you can find us. As always, we will be streaming live from the Murdoch Center Facebook page. Uh, and we will get that information out to you as soon as possible. So thank you and uh, be blessed, all of you. And I'll turn it Amen. back over to you, Reverend Lewis. Amen. Uh, God bless us all. As we come to the end of another hot topic, um, I'd like to close out with um, a few words from each of these gentlemen uh, that we've discussed today. Um, Brother Newton said that there's no reason for the establishment to fear me uh, as the individual, but it has every right to fear the people collectively. Mm -hmm. uh, I am one with the people. And I think that speaks to how all of these gentlemen lived their lives and, and moved their uh their missions forward uh, as being one with their people and being connected. Um, I'm thinking of Brother Turner in Southampton, uh, Carolina, and, and quite often I've heard it said that uh, when racial troubles stir, it's, it's an individual, I've heard an individual that says, um, that is responded by saying uh, Turner's spirit is in the air. And um, that meant to watch out, be very careful. <laughs> and then I think of uh, Mr. Garvey um, as we honor our ancestors who um, reminded us to continue to look for him in the whirlwind. Um, and so with that, um, we say a luta continuum, the struggle continues. Uh, everyone, Flagstaff listeners, wherever you are, be well until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm.